Comis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Margaret McCarthy, a neuroscientist at the University of Maryland whose lab studies the origins and mechanisms of sex differences in the brain, the endocannabinoid system, and the neural basis of animal behavior. We discussed the nature of sex differences observed in the mammalian brain, including differences in the susceptibility to various diseases and disorders of the brain, differences in juvenile play behavior in males versus females, and how these can be altered by sex hormones and cannabinoids, sex differences in brain development that lead to sex differences in behavior, and how the endocannabinoid system in particular influences brain development and behavior. If you're interested in these subjects, this is a really fascinating episode. We get into why juvenile animals play and what the evolution evolutionary purpose of that may be and what the underlying brain development and brain mechanisms are that lead to behavior changes over the lifespan of organisms. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm putting out on this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. You can find the video version on YouTube, and you can subscribe to my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. On my Substack, you'll find all of the podcast episodes in both audio and video format, as well as some of the long-form writing that I occasionally put out that synthesizes what I'm talking about on various episodes of the podcast. You can also become a paid subscriber to support the podcast further, and I appreciate those of you that have been doing that recently. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Margaret McCarthy. Dr. Margaret McCarthy, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what your lab studies? Okay. Um, as you said, I'm Margaret McCarthy, but uh, everybody calls me Peg or Peggy if you're my mother. And uh, what my lab studies is uh, the developing brain uh, with a particular emphasis on trying to understand how the brain develops differently in males versus females. And that's not, that's not, I just want to say that's just not because I'm trying to prove that, you know, girls are smarter than boys or anything like that, but instead because of the uh, enormous gender bias in neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders. Mm. Yeah, no, on your lab website, your, your lab website is uh, really interesting and it's got some, some cool stuff on it, some facts and some diagrams and things. And, and you say that the one of the aims of your lab, at least, is to understand the origins and mechanisms of sex differences in the brain. So um, as a neuroscientist and a biologist, what does biological sex actually refer to in the context of your research? And can you expand a little bit about why, why it's an important area of study? Yeah, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's also somewhat of a controversial area uh, to study. So uh, in, I, I want to just emphasize that I study the laboratory rat. Um, so the laboratory rat does not have gender. It only has a sex. Gender is a purely human construct that involves one's self-perception and society's perception of one's sex. So in our rats, we only have males and females, and uh, there's no gender uh, fluidity. Uh, the reason it's important to understand it from biologically is that in humans, we know that uh, clinically there is an enormous uh, bias in what your relative risk is to be diagnosed with a developmental disorder, um, such as autism spectrum disorders, 
uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorders, early onset schizophrenia, stuttering, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, just about any uh, early onset disorder is going to be more likely to occur in boys. It does occur, they absolutely occur in girls as well. But when we look at probabilities and, and relative risk, they're more likely to occur in boys. But if we flip around and look at um, things that occur predominantly after puberty, like depression, anxiety, compulsion, eating disorders, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, neuroinflammatory disorders, those are much more likely to occur in women about twice as frequently as they do to men. That, so, so clearly there's some kind of a big uh, a shift across the lifespan in your relative risk. But in humans, uh, women, by the time that they become susceptible to these disorders, they've had decades of life uh, living in a gendered world as a woman. And we can't separate out the influence of all of the cultural and societal expectations in that gendered world for both men and women um, to really get at what's biology versus what has been one's lived experience. So that's where the rats come in. It's because we can control all that. We don't have to put up with parents trying to raise them a particular way or dress them and speak to them in particular. We can, we can just cut out all of that sort of experiential things and get purely at the, the biology of the the origins of this um, this relative risk across the lifespan. Interesting. So, so there are differences in in mammals, including humans, but but also rats and other things between males and females in terms of uh, generally what you just said is in terms of their susceptibility to developing different psychiatric conditions. Right now, of course, my rats uh, don't have psychiatric conditions. Right, they 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 don't get autism, they don't get schizophrenia, uh, etc. So what we do is we have to look at what we call sort of phenotypes that are consistent with those disorders in humans. So we look at anxiety-like behavior, say, or depressive-like behaviors. Um, but but there's you know there, there's real limitations into what uh, what we can really model in the animals. Um, what I tend to do more is um, I just try to understand the basic biology of the male versus female brain development and not, not so much in terms of, and, and then I do also try to look at how it responds to perturbations. And, and what we find is that the, the basic developmental trajectory is fundamentally different in particular brain regions, not the entire brain, right? There's nothing I say is about the entire brain. It's really important to keep that clear that there's just different regions. You know, the amygdala develops differently than the hippocampus, which develops differently than the cerebellum, which develops mm. differently than the hypothalamus. You know, people tend to say, oh, a male brain brain versus a female brain. There's no such thing as a male brain or a female brain, right? There, every brain is a mosaic, a, 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 you know, a complimentation of a, a whole bunch of different regions that work independently and intra-dependently, and, which, you know, was why neuroscience is so fun and so complicated. Um, I, I lost my train of thought. Where was, what was I, what question was I answering? No, we, I mean, we're just talking about, um, you know, the susceptibility to different oh, conditions yeah, right, and, and right, behaviors right, right. and things. So, right. Yeah. So, so, so I try to understand, so for example, looking at the amygdala, which we know in humans is associated with a variety of social behaviors, fears, and things like that in adults and anxiety. And it has been implicated in a number of neuropsychiatric disorders. And so I've just asked the simple question, does the amygdala develop differently in males versus females? And then try to understand and how, how is that differently and what are the consequences of that difference? Now, sometimes in other brain regions like the cerebellum, uh, I will ask how does the cerebellum respond to an injury early in life? And is that response different in males than females? So mm -hmm. there's kind of two different ways to, to, to go about it. Got it. So one of the things it says on the website, just to give people a little bit more here to anchor themselves, uh, it says sexual differentiation in the brain of the brain is a developmental process whereby physiological and behavioral phenotypes are modified to match gonadal phenotype to ensure reproductive success. Can you sort of translate that sure. for people that aren't familiar with all those terms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of us are familiar with the idea that a, a, a male mammal is an XY chromosome complement and a female is XX com uh, chromosome complement. But the only consequence of that is that there's a single gene on the Y chromosome that codes for the formation of a testis because there's a little collection of cells that's just, it's bipotential. Um, it, it's, it exists near the, um, the developing kidney and it can become an ovary or it can become a testis, it's you know, bipotential. 
And if there's a, a Y chromosome with this gene called SRY, which is sex determining region of the Y chromosome, that little group of cells will form a testis. And I, and I always love to remind people that you know, we didn't discover this gene until the 1990s. Now, for many people, that seems like yesterday. For some people, they're like, well, I wasn't even born yet. Yeah, but for, for a, lot of, a lot of scientists, that's like yesterday. We only discovered this gene in the 1990s, a guy named Robin Lovell Badge in uh, London. So um, if that gene is present, that little group of cells will become a testis. Um, and if it's not present, that little group of cells will become an ovary. That happens stunningly early in development, right? Uh, in humans, it's within the first couple of weeks, right? And in the rodents, it's in the first couple of days. Uh, in rodents, then everybody thinks about the uh, puberty as being the time when you first see steroid hormones, right? That's when testosterone comes and that's when estrogen and progesterone come. But actually uh, in mammals, the uh, fetal testis begins to make testosterone while he's still a fetus in utero. And in our rodents, that happens about uh, five or six days before the uh, animals are born. In humans, it happens in the second trimester. And there's huge amounts of testosterone that are produced, right? But very high levels, equivalent to adult circulating levels of, of steroid. Wow. Um, and this is after the, the testis is formed and all of the reproductive tracts is formed and everything. And so as far as we know, the only purpose of this surge, we call it a testosterone surge. I love uh, the Japanese call it the testosterone shower. <laughs> um, uh, the nearest we can tell the only purpose of that is to act upon the developing brain to sort of imprint on it if you will um, the, the the physiology and behavior that is consistent with masculinization you know masculine uh, fitness so and in terms of um, the physiology you know the brain controls the pituitary and the pituitary controls the gonads and there's a feedback loop we call that an axis right the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and that axis functions very differently in males and females because males need to make sperm all the time so that they're always sexually receptive whereas females only ovulate periodically in humans about once a month and in our rodents about once a week and so females in most animal species, humans being the notable exception, in most animal species, females will only mate right around the time that they ovulate. And that's the mating behavior is controlled by the brain. The ovulation is controlled by the brain. So if you're going to have those two things be in sync, you have to have the gonad and the brain in sync. I right? see. And likewise, males have to be able to be ready to mate all the time for their fitness, right? So everything is about evolution, maximizing the fitness of males and females relative to their themselves. And so I would imagine that, you know, when we think about something like sexual dimorphism, the, the fact that in most sexually reproducing species, you have two, two morphs that you have the female body plan and the male body plan, which correspond to different physical features, different physiological features of the body. When we think about sexual dimorphism, what are some of the ways that the brains of mammals tend to be sexually dimorphic that hold across species? Are there any general things that hold, or is it really like a species specific thing where, you know, when we think about rats versus humans versus something else, it's, it's going to be species specific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I would say that, that we have some, some generalities that, and some, we haven't been able to ask the question yet. Um, but probably so, so a lot of times, uh, let me just reframe your question for an earlier question, because a lot of times people will just ask me, what are the sex differences in the brain? And that mm -hmm. seems like that should be such an obvious question to answer, right? I should be able to say, oh, well, A, B, C, and D. Um, but it's actually, it's a, it's a lot, it's a more difficult question. So the brain can differ by the size of a particular region, right? So it could be bigger or smaller in males versus females. And that's what we call sort of a macro difference. In humans, it can be the amount of white matter versus the amount of, of gray matter. But then it can also be at the more micro level, it can be the number of synapses that are formed within a particular region, the number of axons that project from one region to another region um, can vary enormously. Um, the, uh, the, the type of the neurons, right? They could be more inhibitory GABAergic or more excitatory glutamatergic and the relative amount of each can vary. So, and then you could have the exact same cell population, but then the genes that they express can differ between males and females. So we could really go from big sort of macro, you know, the hippocampus is bigger down to the, the cellular, exactly what you express differs in males and females. Now there are some uh, generalities that we know about. One of the most famous is what's called the sexually dimorphic nucleus, 
of the Prealtic area, which is was named for its discovery. It's a it's a really fascinating kind of story, I think, a scientific story of how it was discovered. Um, there had been attempts to look for sex differences in the brain in the 1960s. Uh, and, and, you know, if you just hold a brain in your hand, you can't tell a male from a female. They don't come in pink and blue, right? You, you, don't, <laughs> you literally do not know what it is. And um, two sets of scientists, one named, a guy named Don Pfaff at Rockefeller and then another a pair named Raceman and Fields, they looked at very precise exacting, like using electron microscopy to look at, you know, really like they weren't looking at, at, at trees for the forest. They were looking at the bark on the trees, right? You know, really, 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 really detailed. And they found very small and subtle uh, sex differences. One of them only in response to, to an injury, like they did a lesion. This was such huge news that it was published in science. Both, both papers were published in science because nobody had reported anything different in the male and female brain before. Um, and then it's sort of like nothing happened until uh, the 1970s when a guy named Art Arnold, who was also at Rockefeller as a graduate student, uh, was thinking a lot about the brain and he was thinking a lot about behavior and he was studying birds and he was thinking about canaries in which the males sing this extremely complex, beautiful song. That's why everybody wants a male canary and the females just tweet, right? They just, they don't sing. And he, and he, he speculated that that had to be controlled by the brain. And so he took male and female canary brains and he sectioned them and just stained them to just, you know, like we call it a nissel stain, right? Just to visualize them. And he saw this huge nuclear nucleus in the males that was related to the song that was just tiny in the female. So, so it, was, it was available. You, know, you could see it with the unaided eye. It was such a big sex difference. So that was also a science paper that he published along with uh, Fernando Nadebaum. That stimulated a guy named Roger Gorski, who was at UCLA, who had been studying rat brains to understand that difference in the control of the gonads I was talking about earlier, the ovary versus the testis and ovulation versus spermatogenesis to go back and look at his brains just from a distance. And then all of a sudden this little tiny nucleus popped out at him that was much bigger in males and females. And so, and it was at the macro level, right? So he named it the sexually dimorphic nucleus and it happens to be located in the preoptic area, which the preoptic area has nothing to do with vision. It just happens to be a region that's pre to the optic chiasm in the brain. That was in the 1970s, and that really sort of stimulated uh, just a huge amount of interest. And you could almost say, you know, founded the field of, of sex differences in the brain. That nucleus um, exists in just about every, some variant of it, in about every species that we've looked at, including humans. Um, and there's an analog in humans that, that's considered the sexually dimorphic nucleus. It's called the um, uh, anterior nucleus of the interstitial hypothalamus. And it was reported by Simon LeVay in the 1980s that, that uh, it's, it's larger in males and females, in heterosexual males and females. It was right around the times of the AIDS epidemic when a bunch of brains were becoming available from homosexual men who died of AIDS. And that nucleus was smaller in homosexual men than heterosexual men. It was in between heterosexual women and men. It has since been discovered in... Um, sheep in rams, a guy named Chuck Roselli has been studying them out West in which there's about 10% of the rams are naturally occurring, preferring to mate with other rams as opposed to mating with ewes. And in, in the sheep, again, this sexually dimorphic nucleus is different in size. And um, he finds that in the males that prefer to mate with other males, the nucleus is smaller and more on the size of the females. So so that one really, really cuts across uh, quite a few species. There, there are other examples as well, but some things like a lot of the sex differences I've discovered are things like the number of synapses, right? Or the morphology of the astrocytes and things like that. And those are much harder to do in a human brain because mm. you know we don't have the sort of, we can't do the kind of manipulations and microscopy and stuff in, in humans or, or people just haven't done it. I see. So you can get sexual dimorphisms in the brain, differences between males and females at sort of every level of resolution. Some of them are big enough that you can see them with the naked eye, and some of them go all the way down to the level of synapses and molecules and genes and things. Correct. Correct. And are there any general rules for when things are strongly dimorphic between the sexes? So for example, is it fair to say, or is it reasonable that most of the dimorphisms have something to do with brain regions that are related to reproductive behavior or, or is it not limited to reproductive behavior? Yeah. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Um, and at the beginning of the field, the assumption was that they were only related to reproductive physiology and behavior. And in fact, that sort of relegated the field to sort of a, 
sideline of neuroscience, right? It was considered sort of niche, right? And not, not particularly important. Um, and then in the 1990s, a woman named Catherine Woolley, who at the time was a graduate student of Bruce McEwen, published a, a series of papers uh, building on Maya Frankfurt and other people in the lab showing that in the hippocampus, uh, estradiol across the estrus cycle would change the number of synapses across the estrus cycle up to about 30%. And that was considered an absolutely crazy, heretical idea that that could happen. In fact, you know, they had to prove it many ways from Sunday, but um, she and Bruce McEwen are both outstanding scientists. And eventually the community, community had to accept that this was true. And this had nothing to do with reproduction, right? It had to do uh, with, with learning and memory and with stress responding, which is what the hippocampus uh, does. Now that wasn't a sex difference, right? That was a hormonal modulation that she found but that sort of broke open the idea that there could be sex differences in other regions of the brain that were related to other functions than, than reproduction. And, and many have been found. Um, I myself, I still kind of tend towards thinking that they're more related to reproduction, but um, I'm often uh, chastised and corrected on that by a colleague named Larry Cahill, who is absolutely adamant that the magnitude of the sex differences in the hippocampus and some cortical regions are just as great as those that are related to reproduction. And I will say that by and large, with the exception of the sexually dimorphic nucleus, which is really bigly different, <laughs> bigly different, it's about, um, uh, it's it's three to five times bigger in male rats than female rats. And he humans, it's only about one and a half times bigger in males versus females. Most sex differences are, are, are on the one to two fold level. And I, I think that that's by design. I think nature canalizes sex differences to keep the two sexes really separate, but not flying off in completely different directions. Right. So, so you don't want them to be so divergent that it's, you know, females are from Venus and males are from Mars kind of thing, because they reproduction requires such delicate coordination. And plus also a lot of times the two sexes are solving the same problem, right? Mm -hmm. Both sexes have to learn, right? Uh, both sexes have to feel pain. Uh, both sexes are susceptible to uh, habit formation and hence addiction. You know, both sexes have to be stressed and et cetera. So, um, so they're not, most sex differences are, 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 are not, you know, huge, uh, but they're, but they are what I would call reliable, right? You know, I, they're, they're usually not a continuum I, in my, my world uh, and the endpoints that I look at that you tend to have, you got the male and you got the female and you don't have a lot in between. I see. So, so if you, um, let's say that you just sort of picked uh, a random chunk of brain in a random mammalian species, maybe it's a rat, maybe it's a human. Um, if you sort of had uh, infinite data, if you could go in and like count all the synapses or, or look at the gene expression patterns, would you tend to find uh, some kind of difference between males and females on average, or would that be exceptional or would it, you know, happen half the time? It's a, that's a fascinating question. It's a, that would be a great experiment to do because of course we don't do things randomly, right? We always have a, have a reason. Um, and I would, well, yeah. Um, I would say in my experience, I tend to look at a lot of fairly different regions. And for example, uh, when we look at the cerebellum, we don't see any sex differences at all. It, it's hmm. developing. It's developing just exactly the same until we perturb it. If we um, create hypoxic ischemic injury, or if we do a viral inflammation or a bacterial inflammation, then we see, uh, uh, you know, the, the sexes kind of fly apart. And that's called a latent, sometimes called a latent sex difference or a diversion sex difference. And, then, and that's also seen at the cellular and molecular uh, level. But if I look uh, anywhere in the hypothalamus, you'll find sex differences, hippocampus, definitely. Um, there's some cortical regions. I, I don't do cortex. Um, I don't, I don't have a good answer to your question, except for to say that more often than not, if, if you keep digging, you'll find a sex difference. Now, one thing I, I have people come to me all the time with, I've got a sex difference. I found a sex difference. Oh my God, I'm so excited. What am I going to do? And I'll look at their data and I'll be like, yeah, I think you just have noise. You know, I don't really, anything that's like less than one fold is just, you know, it, it, a lot of times the sexes are not different. I, I don't feel like I'm giving you a really good answer because I don't have a clear answer, but I'm always telling my lab, they'll get all disappointed when something's not different. I'm like, it's just as exciting when it's not different and it's just as important. And uh, what we have to do though, is we have to be as sure about no sex difference as we are about 
a sex difference. You know, it has to be just as well powered, right? The ends have to be just as as, as large and stuff. So, um, so like I have a whole new uh, line of inquiry going on in my lab right now where we don't find a sex difference in one brain region and one response, but we do find it in another. And we're asking ourselves, wow, how are the two regions doing this so differently? You know, what and, and why? Again, mm -hmm. why is it important that they not be different in one brain region and that they do be different in another brain region? I see. So it sounds like it's fair to say that when you look for sex differences in the brain, you if you look hard enough, you will often find them. But nonetheless, there are brain regions like the cerebellum where it appears to be uh, more or less the same in both sexes. Yeah. And there are probably many other regions where it is more or less the same. And, and, you know, there's always the reporting bias as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So the reporting bias is towards finding a difference. And people don't tend to when they don't find a difference, they don't report it or it doesn't get attention and et cetera. And of course, then I have a bias because I'm always looking for differences. So I might not be the best person to ask that. Other people might tell you, oh, yeah, we never see sex differences. Um, and the other thing I want to go back to that I think is interesting is so you, you mentioned a couple of things. You, you mentioned the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. You mentioned this testosterone surge or testosterone shower, depending on your taste, that happens um, relatively early in development. With those things in mind, can you kind of connect the dots for people between the gonad, sex hormones, and brain differences that develop? Like, How does that start to happen and how do those things all interact with each other to create some differences? Great, great question. So I, I think you're, I didn't I didn't complete that line of thought, which is so that testosterone surge, what it is doing it is getting into the brain. Um, there are receptors in the brain for testosterone that they're not everywhere, right? They're only expressed in certain regions that are going to be responsive to testosterone. Testosterone is also a precursor to estrogen or estradiol. And there's a whole nother whole set of cells that that have receptors for estradiol or for estrogen um, that, uh, and, and then those receptors are actually what we call nuclear transcription factors. So they actually directly interact with the DNA and they cause the transcription, you know, the turning on or turning off often just as important of particular genes. Um, and then they also actually seem to mediate epigenetic changes so that the turning on or turning off of particular genes is established relatively permanently, right? Throughout, uh, throughout life. One of the Question. So, so that's that's so 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 what I can do in my research program is I can take a newborn female rat and I can inject her with testosterone or estrogen, and I can watch watch experimentally the process of turning her brain into a male brain. And so it's a, it's a great tool, experimental tool that that I have. So I can I can monitor the process of sexual differentiation in real time and I can measure various end, endpoints. Like I can look at the mRNA for various genes. I can look at the morphology of, of neurons, the morphology of astrocytes. I can look at the immune cell profile, et cetera, uh, at, at, at the time. And that's how I get at the mechanism of sex differentiation. That all in my rodents is happening in the first couple of days of life. In humans, it's all happening in utero. Uh, so even if we could inject a human with testosterone, which we couldn't, um, we still wouldn't be able to study it because it's it's happening in utero. So even in primates, it's, you know, like um, rhesus macaques and things, it's all happening in utero, which is, a, it, it's a, we're fortunate that the, the postnatal rat remains sensitive to this. That's why we call it the sensitive period. Um, to testosterone. Now, if I take a newborn rat, I can do that up to about a week. Once she gets to be about 10 days old, if I try to inject her with testosterone, it's too late. She will be a, a female with a female brain for her whole life. Um, and likewise for a male, if I take away testosterone really early, I don't let him get exposed to testosterone. Um, he'll, I can make his brain female-like uh, but if he gets testosterone, once he's exposed, that's it. It's, it's, it's sort of, so, so the kind of the human analogy I give is, um, uh, it used to be a thing called a lazy eye. You know, you had one, one eye that didn't quite look straight. And so the way that doctors used to treat that was is that you would cover the good eye and you would make the, the lazy eye correct itself because it had to work harder. But if you didn't do that early in childhood, the eye would never realign. So there was a sensitive period during which it could happen. And then it's too late. And that's that's the nature of development, right? Development has things that if they don't happen at the right time, they'll never happen. 
the really fascinating question to me, though, is in, in the sex differentiation case, is that everything is happening in a pop, a little, looks like a little pinky eraser, right? You know, it's, it's not capable of any kind of reproductive function. It can't even walk, right? It doesn't even have its eyes open. And in that little pinky pop, in that little tiny brain, you're coding for its ability as an adult to either be, you know, mounting and emitting and ejaculating, to be aggressive, um, to be highly anxious, you know, to prefer the odor of females, all of these things that are not going to occur for months, right? Um, and so I'm really fascinated. It's like, how is that stored in the brain? How is that coded in the brain? To go all that time and then it's not expressed until after puberty. Um, it's a so really we, we don't know anything about about that. Interesting. Um, so, so when people think about like sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, estrogen, things like that, these are literally molecules that are produced in the body. They go through the bloodstream and they can get into the brain and not only into the brain, but they, they physically go inside the cells and directly in some cells, at least directly sort of control which genes are coming on and off and, and having their effect through that kind of mechanism. Precisely. Yes. Yes. And there was just a beautiful paper published in Nature uh, by a name, a woman named Jessica Tolkien at Cold Spring Harbor, in which she really lays out the, the genes that are she uses very, very modern cutting edge te techniques um, in three different brain regions and shows exactly what's getting turned on early, what's getting turned on in adulthood, et cetera. Yeah. I see. Steroids are, are, people don't appreciate how powerful steroids are. They they tend to think of them like, you know, other other hormones, you know, say like insulin or something, but they're, they're a completely different class of compounds. Interesting. And so these things go in inside of cells, they control their development with a caveat that it really depends on what phase of development you're in. If, if it's at the right time, so to speak, they right. can have a huge effect and they might have little or no effect if it's, if it's too late and some window of opportunity has closed. Correct. Yep. That's exactly right. And then the final piece that was interesting there to me was that a lot of the tracks for these sex typical or sex specific behaviors are being laid down way before the behaviors ever express themselves. So somehow these changes happen and develop, and then they are sort of latent or stored in the brain only to sort of do what they're going to do later on. Yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the things um, that we'll probably end up talking about because you've studied it specifically has to do with juvenile play behavior in rats, which is sexually dimorphic. And, and we'll talk about that. But before we get to the rat stuff specifically, can you just talk about juvenile play behavior in mammals generally? How common is it? And what do we think the, the general biological function it, it serves as? Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that question. So um, first, a little background on, on play. Um, in that it, 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 it's juvenile play behavior, as you said, and it, so it only occurs during a, a restricted period of time. And it's usually in, in our rodents, it's like just around re weaning and until puberty. And once you get past puberty, you know, interest in play goes away. And instead you're interested in mating and being territorial and et cetera. Um, and it, 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 it's a mystery still to this day, what the purpose of play is. Somehow we all think intuitively it must be important, right? But, but we, nobody, and it's debated by, you know, psychologists, psychoanalysts, parents, teachers, and neuroscientists. And it used to be a very intense topic of uh, investigation by neuroscientists uh, back in the 1980s because back then the rat was the favored animal model for neuroscience. Then the, the transgenics, the power of the transgenics mouse swept in in the 90s. And of course that just, you know, really pushed aside most of the research in rats because it was so powerful to have this ability to manipulate the genome. And it turns out mice are actually one of the very, very few species that do not engage in this very complex uh, play behavior. So how, what do I mean by complex play behavior? When you put two rats together, so just a look, just like puppies or kittens, um, they will chase each other. They will, uh, one will pounce on the other and the other one will roll over onto its back to expose its ventrum. And then they'll jump up and they'll reverse. And the other one will chase the other one. And they'll do the same things. They'll stand up and they'll box with each other. And sometimes they just wrestle, you know, they just roll around and wrestle and, um, we know it's rewarding. They like it. You know, if you let them play in a place that they, they condition to it, and they want to come back to that place. There's no aggression. There's never any biting. Um, it's when it's going well, it's reciprocal. 
if it if you get into a situation where one animal is always dominating the other and and sort of pinning it, the, the play extinguishes because the other one's like, you're not any fun. You don't let me pin you, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, and that's that's also true, you know, in so many species that we know of that we all, you know, all of our pets and everything. One of the fascinating things I think about our pets is that they are particularly dogs. They still play uh, post puberty, which is mm. really another interesting question. Um, the reason that I got so interested in it is that across all species that play, uh, males will play more intensely, more physically, more frequently than females. Females do play. They are very physical. They're just not quite as uh, intense and physical as males. And what fascinates me about that is that when they are at the age that they're playing, there's no steroid hormones around, right? This is hmm. like, think about like a six or seven year old child, right? They don't have any hormones at this time, right? So all so the sex difference is coded by the hormones early uh, in development, just like adult sex behavior and, and adult aggression, but it's expressed at a time that there's no hormones around. And so that means you're really comparing apples to apples, right? As opposed to an adulthood when males and females have very different hormonal pro profiles. Um, and so it, and then, so I also think that the fact that there's this difference between males and females can maybe open a window into what is the purpose of play? You know, do we really need play kind of thing? And that's, that's one of the avenues that my lab is exploring right now. Mm -hmm. well, one, I mean, one way I suppose you could look at that, and I don't know if this has been done, has, has anyone simply tried depriving juvenile rats, say, of play behavior and see what the downstream consequences are for their reproductive behavior or something like that? What, what an excellent idea. Yes. Um, um, that was done. Um, it has been done many times back in the 80s, but mostly it was done by just completely isolating the animals. So putting them alone in a cage away from all other animals. And it turns out that's about one of the meanest things you can do to a juvenile rat. They're very, very social animals. And it's very, very stressful for them to be isolated. So what we've been doing in my lab, and 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 I should all say it was all only done in males um, because all of the research back in the early days was only done uh, in male animals. Um, so one of the things that we've done, a graduate student named Ashley Morquat in the laboratory, is she created a cage, a, a normal rat cage, in which she put a perforated barrier, plexiglass perforated barrier down the middle so that the, you can put an animal on each side and they can see each other, they can hear each other, they can smell each other, they can tiny, tiny, tiny little bit touch each other, but they can't play. And so she houses them like that through the entire juvenile period. And then she uh, gets them through, you know, takes them back out, puts them back into group housing at, at puberty, and then they go into and in adulthood, she's measured a whole lot of behaviors. And what she has found is that the males show impaired, impaired sexual behavior. They're slower to interact with the female sexually, and they interact um, less frequently. They show a longer latency. They have fewer mounts, fewer ejaculations, et cetera. Conversely, they seem to be hyper aggressive. So mm. sometimes people say, oh, play is a rehearsal for aggression. No, play is probably a rehearsal for appropriate aggression, not, you know, and so so they're they're much quicker to attack a stranger, et cetera. They have a very bizarre um, response to sort of a social preference test. And it would say also it's like a hyper exaggerated response, which we think is has to do with um, dominance hierarchies and not knowing how to interact to, to, to establish dominance hierarchies. And then they show a little bit of cognitive impairment. Uh, fascinatingly, the females are completely normal. Hmm. They show no effect whatsoever of having been uh, deprived of play. And, and further, if during in the middle of this period of this, you know, not being allowed to play, if we just we free them from these barrier cages and allow them to, to have a play date, the males are exuberantly playful. Right. I mean, they just show a huge exaggeration in their play and the females are like they just are, again, unaffected. So so it's a really um, fascinating difference that why. Why would the play be important to one sex and not the other? Um, and and again, it, yeah, it's just we're just really fascinated by why is it the females should, are they just resilient to the stress? Uh, they when they when they sit in the cage together, I keep going like this because they sit right next to each other. They know the other animals across the, the the barrier, right? And they they sit right there, and somehow that's just enough socialization for the females. I don't know, maybe they're chatting away or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that was that was another question I had is when we talk about um, this play behavior in rats, we're, we're referring typically to this 
um, easy to measure, easy to see, like rough and tumble wrestling type behavior. Conceivably, there's there's other ways they interact that are more difficult to discern. Yes, yes, that's an excellent, excellent point. And in fact, the play is so uh, fast and vigorous, we have to videotape it and then slow it down to, to score it. And so one of the exciting things that's happening in neuroscience right now is computer vision learning. Mm. Um, so you can use artificial intelligence to, and and so we started this process. There's there's various programs out there. There's quite a few of them that are developing to see if, if the computer can see something that we're not seeing, right? Um, and, but it's um, the challenges that these two animals, they, the, you know, you can, teach the computer to track one and we can get the computer to follow them around as they're like chasing each other, but as soon as then they interact and then they become a furry ball, right? And then it's really hard for the computer to tell who's who. So we're working on that, but, but you, you raise an excellent point um, is that we do think that there could be things that are going on that, that we aren't detecting. There could be ultrasonic vocalizations that they're making to communicate with each other that we can't discern. And again, these are just technical problems because we can record ultrasonic vocalizations, but um, we, we can't tell which one is vocalizing, right? Mm. Because so things of that sort. So, but um, yeah, I, I, I think those are exciting questions to pursue in the future. Yeah. Well, you said a couple of things that were super interesting. So when we think about depriving the rats of play, a, there was this dimorphism there. So the, the deprivation of play affected males more than females. Um, it resulted in subsequent deficits in their adult behavior, such as the reproductive behavior and their propensity towards aggression, um, as you mentioned, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive to people, but I think not so much once you think, think about it. If you, don't let, if you don't let the male rats do rough and tumble play with each other, then they become hyper-aggressive. They basically don't know how to appropriately interact with other males and, and other members of the species later on. And you also said that if you deprive them for a little while, then they become like really, really excited to play even more. So that implies that this is almost homeostatically regulated the same way yeah. that other processes in the body are, which, which would also say that something very crucial is happening here. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I hadn't thought about it in terms of being homostatically regulated, but, but um, we, you're absolutely right. In fact, we know sometimes in our experiments, if we want to do things like we want to um, look at the, the neurons that are activated by a play bout, right? Uh, so we'll look at an emer uh, um, e immediate early genes expression in a particular brain region after a play bait. What we'll do is we'll isolate the animals for 24 hours before the play date. Um, and then we know we'll get this huge exaggeration uh, in play. And uh, so you're right. It's like, and, but so or other times what we do is we let them play to, together every day for like 10 days in a row, they meet a playmate in the afternoon uh, that they go and it's not their cage mate. It's not their sibling. It's their playmate. And they go to a neutral arena. It's not in their home cage and they get about 15 minutes to play and they'll just steadily play the same amount pretty much across the whole 10 days uh, kind of thing. So in, unless we isolate them and then boom. And if we, if we introduce a new playmate that it doesn't affect the males, but the females, they're like, I don't know who you are and they don't, they don't play with the, the introduced animal. Hmm. And now will, will juvenile male rats preferentially play with other males or do they play differently with juvenile males versus females? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, if we look in terms of the intensity of play, the highest is male to male medium is male to female and lowest is female to female. And when you do mixed groups, um, cause what we do now is we, we started out, we would do like six animals together. And we would just watch the the all six animals, which was crazy. Yeah, because <laughs> you got to label them and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, it's a good question whether or not the males initiated more with other males. And that's where, like, if we can get really sophisticated computer learning would be a, a vision learning would be a good question to ask. Um, but definitely, you know, one of the challenges of studying the behavior is that it does require reciprocity. And so if the other animal is not playing the same, that will kind of extinguish it. And so we've been looking at things like um, rats with genetic mutations for genes that are, are um, identified in autism and to see if their play behavior has changed. And it is, uh, and it, it's reduced. And what we have to do is we have to put the two, like the, the genetically mutated rats, two together. Like we can't do a mixed dyad because it, it, it won't reveal the effects, but so you have to sort of exaggerate it. Um, but anyway, I, I, whether or not there's a preference for a male with a male, I don't think so, but they'll get 
they'll have more reciprocity from a male. And so that just naturally exaggerates the behavior. I see. So, so this play behavior is sexually dimorphic, both in terms of uh, how vigorously and how frequently it happens in males versus females. It's also dimorphic in terms of how important or influential it is on their subsequent adult behavior. Because if you deprive males, they have deficits in, in reproduction and aggressive behavior, as you said. You don't see that in females. So the next question is really, okay, this is super interesting. Where does it come from? And I know that a lot of your work has looked at how this type of difference develops and how the endocannabinoid system in particular ties into that. So can you start to tell us that story of, of where this dimorphism comes from? Yeah. Yeah. So first you have to start is what is the neural circuitry of play, right? What, you know, in the brain in general, where, where does play come from? And um, there is a, a very strong consensus in the field now of what we call the social behavior network. Um, and now there's also what's called a core aggression network. And these um, are, are, are brain regions that are interconnected that regulate social behaviors include, and then also aggressive behavior. And they usually start with the olfactory system, either the main or accessory olfactory system. And then you're going to have projections to the uh, amygdala. You're going to have participation of the prefrontal cortex. You're going to have a component of the reward pathway, the VTA nucleus accumbens, you know, the BNST, and then you sort of kind of go down to the midbrain to the spinal cord. Um, the, the, and, and the neural circuitry of play, near as we can tell, we don't know it as well as we do the others because a lot of that has been really finely mapped now in the mouse. Um, the neural circuitry of play is overlapping with the social behavior network. It's the same network, which is also fascinating because then like, why does play go away, right? Why, why does it extinguish with puberty? Um, but fascinatingly, the sex difference is only in the medial amygdala. You could you, know, you could imagine it being a distributed property, right? That it would yeah. just be, it would be redundant through the entire social behavior network, but it's not. It's only in the medial amygdala. And why do we know that? We know that because if you take a newborn female rat pup and you put testosterone only in her medial amygdala, three weeks later or four weeks later, when she starts to play, she'll play like a male, hmm. right? You don't have to have the testosterone anywhere else in the brain. So I we see. know so, that. So okay. there's one spot medial amygdala in this case, you put testosterone in a female. So it's at levels that resemble what would be naturally in a male. And later on, when she becomes a juvenile, she'll play like a male. Right. Right. Hmm. So my question was, what is that testosterone doing? Right. What is its, me what's its cellular mechanism of action? And uh, we had been doing some other studies on the hippocampus where we had seen some sex differences in neurogenesis. Uh, actually with males making more new neurons than females in the first couple of days of life. And I had a new postdoc in the lab uh, named Desiree Krebs Craft. And I said, well, you know, the amygdala is in the same sections as the hippocampus. Uh, why don't you just go and look at the, the newborn cells in the amygdala and see if there's any sex difference there? So she did. We do this with a BRDU injection. That's a, a, a thymidine analog that labels newborn cells. You know, you have to then section the brain and look at it. And she went and counted the newborn cells in the medial amygdala. And lo and behold, she found that there were more newborn cells in the female than in the male. And that was exciting because, you know, usually everything's always more in the male, more in the male, more in the male. <laughs> and so she's like, oh, well, that's cool. So there's more newborn cells in the female than the male. And then she's like, well, now what? You know, I was like, yeah, now what? That's a good question. Well, I had a, sometimes science occurs in funny ways. I had a colleague named Brad Alger who studied the endocannabinoid system. He was one of the pioneers of the system. And uh, after, you know, at this point, I think we've been colleagues for, I don't know, 20 years or something. And every single seminar, every thesis defense, every journal club, every thesis proposal during the question and answer session, he would stand up and say, you know, endocannabinoids can explain that. <laughs> whatever, whatever it was, whatever phenomenon it was, I mean, literally. So I just literally said to her, I don't know, let's look at endocannabinoids. Maybe, maybe they're regulating the, uh, that's, that's literally how it happened. And so she said, okay. And she took a, a, a pan agonist for the CB1 and CB2 receptor, which are the two receptors on which endocannabinoids and also THC um, act. And she injected uh, animals. We just did a pharmacology experiment and, and she was able to reverse the sex difference that she was able to bring down the number of newborn cells in the female to the level of the male. So she was able to eliminate the sex difference. And since we knew from the previous work in the 1980s of Bruce McCune and Michael Meany that the medial amygdala was critical to the sex difference and play behavior, she then looked at social play behavior and she found that it also 
the treatment with the uh, pharmaceutical drugs that mimicked uh, THC had also sex reversed the play behavior. And that set us off on this journey to understand really precisely what the endocannabinoids were doing. So, so just to reiterate, so what, so, so you give testosterone to a female specifically in the medial amygdala, her subsequent play as a juvenile will look like a male. And the same thing happens if you give an activator of CB1, CB2. Correct. And you I don't see. even have to give it into the amygdala. We just give it under the skin. You know, we give it sub Q. I see. Yeah. And does that happen also with THC itself? Yes, it does. We haven't published that work yet. So yes, but we have, um, and this is Jonathan Van Risen, uh, who has been carrying on this work and he's preparing the manuscript now in which if we inject newborn pups with THC at exactly the same time that we would do testosterone, it, um, it does, it has the same effect on the newborn cells and it has the same except effect on the play behavior. Interestingly, if he gives THC to pregnant rats, earlier. So we're looking at, because we're trying to model human cannabis use during pregnancy. If we give it much earlier, it has the opposite effect in terms of play behavior. It actually suppresses play behavior. So it promotes play behavior in the young animals uh, that when you give it to the newborns and it suppresses it during fetal, if it's given during fetal life. And we don't know the mechanism of that, but again, it's just the importance of, t- of timing development. Mm-hmm. It's all about timing. Yeah. You can get the opposite effect at two different times with the same right. treatment. Right. So, so is there some kind of interaction you guys are hunting down between um, the sex hormones like testosterone and the endocannabinoid receptors? Do we know exactly where that link is? Right. So, so that this is where the story got really, really interesting. Um, we did all that, those obvious things, right? So we looked for uh, sex differences in the endocannabinoid receptors and sex differences in the endocannabinoids themselves. And we did find that in fact, males have a higher level of the endogenous endocannabinoid called 2AG. And, and endocannabinoids are a funny signaling system, right? They are a, a membrane derived signaling molecule that um, has sort of, that's sort of continuously produced all the time. And so there's like a tone, right? You have like a certain tone of endocannabinoids that you, you sit at. And so the conclusion was that males have a higher endocannabinoid tone than females. And if we give females testosterone, they make more, and well, they have a higher tone. It's either because they're making more or they're degrading it less. A big part of the endocannabinoid system is it's like, you know, think about it as a, you know, a, a, well, how to think about, it. basically you make it and you degrade it and you can either make it faster or degrade it faster. And that will shift the amount either way. Um, so, so it's definitely the endocannabinoid tone, not the receptors that was different. Uh, but then it was like, well, what, what are the endocannabinoids actually doing? And we were thinking about the adult and all the things that are known in the adult about how it regulates synaptic physiology. They have you know, presynaptic inhibition, depolarization, induced suppression, et cetera. And none of that applied to the development of the amygdala, which it makes sense in retrospect because it's, it's just not developed yet. It doesn't have all that synaptic uh, activity. Um, and so when we're trying to think about cell genesis, so for, the big question was what who are those newborn cells, right? Mm. Those born. And of course you think it's going to be neurons. And, and then certainly in the hippocampus, we had shown it was neurons, but again, in retrospect, it makes sense. It wasn't, they weren't neurons at all. It was the glial cells known as the astrocytes, right? Um, so these are the sort of, had always been considered the support cells of the brain. Uh, but we now know they're actually very, very active cells um, and that they're really important to synaptic physiology and et cetera. And, and Desiree first identified that, in, in fact, that it did look like it was the astrocytes, that there was more in the females than the males, Desiree Krebscraft. And then uh, Jonathan Van Risen um, really confirmed that, but he added in the really interesting and unexpected twist of that he brought in a, a third cell type called microglia. Now, the problem with microglia is their name. Um, they are not glia. They are not astrocytes in any way. Uh, and they're not micro either because they're 10% of your brain. What they actually are is are a modified immune cell and it's a modified macrophage. And they are born very early in development and they, they get into your brain and they take up residence and they stay there your whole life. And they're scattered throughout. They're peppered. Actually, we call it... Um, They're tiled through your entire brain. Your entire brain is full of microglia and they're there as your brain's immune system. They're very, they're unique to the brain. They're nowhere else in the body. 
And what Jonathan found was that rather than, um, it used to be we thought microglia, we called them quiescent. We thought they just sat there waiting for an accident to happen. And then they would maybe, you know, release cytokines or prostaglandins and respond to the injury. Um, with the advent of the transgenic mice and the amazing things that you can do with transgenic mice, we were able to visualize them in the living brain and found out that they're not quiescent at all. They're actually moving around all the time. And they're always checking on the other cells around them. Uh, but what Jonathan found, uh, and again, just to repeat Jonathan Van Risen, um, is that these, these um, macrophages, these, these immune cells, were in fact engulfing the newborn cells in large phagocytic cups, the living newborn cells, and they were actually then killing and consuming them basically by consuming, I mean, they, 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 they degrade them. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. so these are effectively like immune cells of the brain. And just like a white blood cell or something in your body might eat a bacteria from an infection, they're eating newborn neurons in this case, newborn astrocytes, newborn astrocytes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And in, 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 in an exquisitely tightly controlled manner, uh, which is what's so also fascinating. And that control is coming from the endocannabinoid tone, right? So the higher endocannabinoid tone in the males uh, acts on the microglia to make them hung basically give them the munchies. <laughs> it, makes, it makes them hungrier and they consume more of the newborn astrocytes. Um, and so the females wind up with more of those astrocytes surviving. Um, and so that as they get to the time of the juvenile playtime, the females needle amygdala has more resident astrocytes than the male does. And you still say, well, what does that have to do with, with play? Well, what Jonathan Van Risen is showing now is that those astrocytes are actually inhibiting the play neurons because they're releasing a, a adenosine, a chemical called adenosine. So the more astrocytes you have, the more inhibition you have of the play neurons. And the males have escaped from that break, basically hmm. by killing off their astrocytes when they were young. I see. Um, I don't want to go. I don't know if I want to go on this tangent, but, but you said adenosine is involved here. That immediately makes me think about caffeine. Oh, Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So there's some, so basically development is happening in males and females naturally under normal conditions, you'll have different levels of endocannabinoids. They'll be higher in males, I think is what I'm hearing. And that will make the, the microglia hungrier and they'll eat, literally eat and digest these things called astrocytes. And that sort of uh, releases the ability to have more play behavior in juvenile males and suppresses it in females. Exactly. Exactly. And, and interestingly, they only eat the newborn astrocytes, right? They like the babies, right? <laughs> which is once the astrocytes are mature, they don't seem to consume mm -hmm. them. So a natural question here is, um, you know, similar to what I asked before uh, about deprivation of play, you said that if you deprive uh, a male of its ability to do rough and tumble play with other juveniles, it has downstream consequences, negative consequences on the adult behavior, both on the aggression side and the reproduction side. What happens uh, to adult behavior if you say masculinize the females or, or do the reverse? Does, does something similar happen downstream? Yeah, that, you know, that's an excellent question. And we have not done that experiment. Uh, that's a, because, and, and I think that, so if we gave hormones to do that experiment, it like to peripherally say, then it would masculinize everything, right? Because it would invoke another, another mechanism in the hypothalamus and another mechanism in the hippocampus, et cetera. If we give the endocannabinoids, um, that's, a, that's a interesting. When, what we have to do. So, so when I give a newborn female testosterone and I, and I turn her brain male, and if I take her to adulthood and I want to see her do male sex behavior, I have to give her testosterone again, right? Because no, even a normal male will not show sex behavior without testosterone. I see. Um, but you know, you, you raised an interesting idea. I have not thought about if we gave the endocannabinoids, would that it would could we get them with just adult testosterone to start to show male like sex behavior? That's a that's an interesting idea. I got to think about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, one, I mean, potential prediction would be that yeah, if you're if you're masculinizing the play behavior and the juvenile behave play behavior is causally related to adult reproductive behavior, um, you know, would, would in, at least in the presence of testosterone, would a masculinized uh, female start exhibiting male-like mating behavior as an adult? Great idea. Great idea. I like that. 
I think we'll try it. Interesting. Um, so, I mean, what else can you say about this general subject? Is, that, is there anything that we've missed in terms of what your lab has studied with respect to the endocannabinoid regulation of this particular dimorphic behavior? Or, or did we kind of cover most of the story there? I think we covered most of it. Yeah, we we're now trying to hunt down, you know, further details on exactly which cells have the receptors and what, who's making the endocannabinoids and things. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, and another thing worth talking about. So you mentioned that, you know, if you give some of these things, whether it's hormones or endocannabinoids, you know, at different phases of development, it can have a very different effect. It can even have the opposite effect depending on on when you give these things. So can you talk a little bit more about about sensitive periods and like what? What is determining that? Why is it that giving, you know, a molecule of some kind, whether it's testosterone or an endocannabinoid or THC or whatever, why, what's actually allowing it to have two different effects if you give it relatively early versus relatively late? Yeah. Yeah. Another really fascinating question. Why, why does the sense, what, what makes the sensitive period end, right? Would be a, yeah. another way of putting it. And that's a really, we know that we, we operationally define the onset of the sensitive period as the time when male fetal testes start to make testosterone. But why do females eventually become insensitive? Why can't I just give a female at, you know, 30 days old and change her brain into male? And it used to be because we thought, well, the, the, the events that are changing are things like cell death, right? And cell proliferation and the wiring up of synapses and things like that. And those are all considered permanent endpoints, right? You can't undie uh, and, you know, you can only have be reborn. And, and then we think of synapses, um, synaptic wiring is like, you know, plugging up an extension cord into the wall, right? And there I've, there I've made my synaptic connection and there it will stay forever. But interestingly, we now know all of those things are much more plastic than we thought. Synapses come and go, and actually cells continue to proliferate and continue to die throughout the brain. And because we used to talk about the blueprint for sex differentiation, the neural architecture of sex differentiation. I don't, I don't use those words very much anymore because one of the surprising discoveries that we made along the way was, um, as I mentioned before, those steroid hormones, they are transcription factors, but they also appear to be able to modify the genome epigenetically and epigenetic modifications are when it's, it's um, you know, every cell in your body has every single gene, right? But it only expresses a subset of it. So that's why a hepatocyte in your liver stays a hepatocyte and a retinal cell stays a retinal cell, right? And because if, if they started to express the wrong genes, you have to silence those genes epigenetically. But the brain appears to have a different set of rules when it comes to epigenetics. It uses it much more plastically to modify gene expression for, you know, in, in, in response to experiences and things like that. And one of those experiences is whether or not you've been exposed to hormones. So a graduate student in the lab named Bridget Nugent was very interested in the epigenetic modifications of induced by steroids during development. And she just looked at one of the modifications is DNA methylation. Uh, you put a methyl group onto a cytosine, the cytosine of, uh, you know, the guanine, cytosine, thymidine, and um, adenine. And um, she found that if she looked in the preoptic area, which controls male sex behavior, there was more methylation on average in females than males. So there was more gene suppression, right? And uh, right, and, and it turned out that's because in the males, in response to the testosterone, they actually turned off the enzyme that puts methyl groups on the DNA. So they expressed more cells and the females silenced cells. Well, she can use a drug called zebularin, which in, actually also inhibits that enzyme the same way that testosterone does. This is actually a drug that's used in cancer therapeutics because a lot of cancers are escaped from epigenetic suppression. And if she gave that drug late outside the sensitive period, it kind of peeled off the methylation groups on the DNA and it made the females sensitive again. So, so, the, so we came to the conclusion that the female brain has to constantly maintain a suppression of the male transcriptome in this particular region, um, because the male transcriptome sort of wants to, to, to burst through. And so they, she sort of maintains it in a, in a silent state. But if you peel it back, you can get back to the, you can get the male pattern. Fascinatingly, it turns out that's also something that's going on in the gonads. I, you know, you think you couldn't get more terminal than an ovary versus a testis, right? But there's a particular gene in the ovary that if it is silenced at any time, if it's turned off, a testicular tissue will begin to develop. 
and you'll have what's called an ova testis. You'll have a mix of ovary and testis. So we have to really, you know, really rethink things about um, how permanent uh, a lot of these changes are. It really opens up a whole lot about the plasticity that's potentially there. You know, when I think about evolutionarily, you know, what is the optimal uh, way to go? You, you could be Mother Nature is like always hedging her bets. You know, you never know when I might need to change back between the sexes kind of thing. And so don't make it permanent. Uh, just make it, you know, um, enduring. I see. Interesting. So, you know, one of the things we've talked about the dimorphism at the level of the juvenile play behavior, and we've talked about it at the level of, you know, what's going on uh, in terms of what the cells are doing and things like endocannabinoid tone. So at least for the, for the males, uh, for, for juvenile rats, the males have higher endocannabinoid tone. And, and that is a, an important piece of why the play behavior differs between the sexes. We also know that um, cannabinoids and, and cannabis products in humans often affect men and women differently. And this brings us to the question of how dimorphic the endocannabinoid system itself tends to be in, in the brain and in the body. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, well, you know, I don't know that I can. I don't think I have a lot of expertise on it throughout the body. Um, I've really only studied it in the medial amygdala. So. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to ask you too is it, it sounds like you've explicitly created rat models for studying the effects of cannabinoids, including THC, um, on development. So um, you know, rat models of you know what is in utero THC exposure, you know what kind of effect is that going to have on the juveniles and subsequent adults that they develop into? What um, what have you done there, and what results have come out in terms of what's already been published, and yeah. how does that start to make you think about the the human implications? Yeah. Okay. So there, uh, we did a collaboration with Matt Hill at the University of Calgary, um, in which uh, our laboratory um, injected pregnant animals with THC, and his laboratory uh, set up to do THC inhalation through a you know vaping mechanism. And then uh, Matt is the world's leading expert in measuring um, endocannabinoids and also THC in, in the brain. It's really, it's actually really, really hard to do because they're lipophilic molecules. But anyway, his lab measured the THC uh, in the um, placenta and in the maternal circulation and in the fetal brain. And they measured also uh, metabolites of THC, some of which, which are active and some of which aren't. Both the, the inhalation mechanism and the injection mechanism, because the argument being, well, you know, people don't inject themselves with THC, right? They smoke it or they eat it. Um, both of those resulted in an enormous accumulation of endocannabinoids in the placenta. And in some cases, uh, at, at some time points, an equilibration between maternal plasma THC and metabolites level and fetal brain levels. So, so an enormous amount was getting into the, the fetal brain. So that, that has implications obviously for uh, cannabis use during uh, human pregnancy. A woman named Yasmin Hurd at um, Mount Sinai has done a lot of work on humans and their uh, in, in ingestion of cannabis during pregnancy. It's uh, increasing in, at a very rapid rate because of perceptions of safety. And I, you know, I think we need to know, you know, if, if it's safe or not, it might be safer than say alcohol or opiates, but we, we don't really know yet. Um, and partly too, is a lot of the literature that we had on it was done back in the seventies and eighties. And the THC content at marijuana at that time was completely different than, you know, people are smoking a lot of oregano, right? And <laughs> whereas now it's um, completely different. Yasmin has found uh, some very, Yasmin heard again at, at um, Mount Sinai has found some, some deleterious effects in, in humans. Um, and she's tied that to some specific uh, mechanisms. We so far, you know, we don't see anything like, I would say like deleterious per se, we see like natural variation in behavior. Uh, but again, I, it's, it's just um, in our rats, but it, it really does speak to, I, I you know, I think kind of like uh, we know you shouldn't drink alcohol during pregnancy. And uh, if, if you, the main, the question is why smoking cannabis during pregnancy for some women, it's the nausea. And of course, nausea is very serious. You know, it, it can be really devastating, but um, but it, I, I guess if I were talking to a young person today, I would say, don't, don't think it's safe compared to alcohol because we just really don't know yet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's I sub- definitely getting, if, it's like, you know, the old saying used to be, if you smoke, your baby smokes, it's the same for, for cannabis. Yeah. And I suppose that even if we don't know a lot of the details yet, it's, it sounds like it's safe to say that certainly cannabinoid exposure in utero is going to have some effect on the developmental trajectory of, of the brain. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we've done a deep dive into one particular brain region connected to one particular outcome, but this, the endocannabinoid system is one of the very first to develop in the brain and the receptors for the um, endocannabinoids are considered the most abundant G coupled protein receptors in the brain. So they're so ubiquitous and widespread that it's hard to imagine that there isn't some impact. And also that concentration in the placenta um, there and, and the endocannabinoid receptors are expressed all throughout the reproductive axis. So it might even not just be direct effects on the fetal brain. You start messing with the placenta, you're going to really impact fetal brain development um, as well. So which has been shown in quite a few studies recently, some of them by uh, Tracy Bale, who's shown that um, placental abnormalities following maternal stress can impact the developing brain. So, so yeah, I mean, we, 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 and you know, here in the states, we've been really hampered in our ability to study uh, THC. Um, it's extremely difficult to get. I have to have a um, DEA license. That's uh, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. It takes over a year to get the license, um, and it's tremendously tight monitoring of it. And, uh, you know, it, people always say, well, can't you go out on the corner and, and buy it, which is absolutely true, but I can't do research with what I can buy on the corner. Uh, I can buy it legally, uh, you know, through medicalization, et cetera. Um, but because the, the reason it's so, it, I can get oxycodone or easier, I can get cocaine easier than I can get THC. Wow. And yeah. And the reason is because um, there is no, agreed upon medical use for THC. There's medical use for oxycodone and cocaine, right? Um, and so that's one of the reasons there's such a push to, to legalize the medical use of cannabis so that, because we're really hampered in our ability to study it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of feedback from something on the desk, I, I think. Oh, yeah, that's me messing, sorry. Um, no worries. Um, another area I would love just like your general take on that I mean, I don't know too, too much about this, but, you know, my understanding is, you know, given everything that, that you studied to do with development and sex hormones and all of this stuff, um, my understanding is that a lot of the stuff that we're eat humans today in, in the modern world, a lot of the stuff that we're eating that's coming in our diet, um, a lot of the stuff in our environment contains stuff, whether it's with trace amounts or even non-trace amounts of drugs and things that are influencing all sorts of stuff in our body, including sex hormones and things like this. So what, um, I mean, what can you say about that? Do you have any concern as a sort of neuroendocrinology person about the effect the modern human environment is actually having on our development and on sex hormones and all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about endocrine disrupting compounds. Yeah. Which are found in plastics and in fertilizers and, and, um, uh, fungicides and things like that. And yeah, it's such a, who it's such a difficult field. Um, it's a, it, it's, I used to do some endocannabinoid, uh, disrupting research and, um, it, the, the, the best evidence that they are in fact in the environment are having damage. It's not the dropping sperm count in men. That, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's the uh, increased incidence of hypospadiasis uh, in boys. What is that? Uh, that's, that's when the urethra does not grow all the way to the tip of the penis and it exits along the shaft. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a devastating condition and it has to do with insufficient, you know, impaired androgen action. It's very clear. We, we understand it, it very well kind of thing. The other, you know, and, and there's no doubt if you measure the fat tissue, if you measure um, breast milk, et cetera, all of these compounds are, are in our bodies for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's funny back in my day, it was lead, right. It was lead in the gasoline and things like that. And we knew, you know, definitely having effects and got that all cleared out. You know, there's not, you don't detect lead in kids' blood anymore, but now you can detect uh, bisphenols and et cetera. And, and it, it's much, it, it's not as clean cut as, as, you know, the effects of, of lead were, but there's, Certainly, uh, the fact that we still allow RAID to be used, you know, all of the, the um, pesticides and things like that, or yeah, this is big, 
they're, 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 it's scary. But that being said, humans are probably healthier now. Americans, you know, other than our abysmal maternal health, maternal fetal health uh, statistics, which is not has, does not have to do with environmental plasticizers. Um, you know, the the nutrition that we have now is so high uh, that that's you know I think those are counteracting forces. You know, puberty keeps advancing in in humans, um, particularly in the Western world. I think, and uh, particularly in girls, we estimate about six months a decade that puberty is occurring earlier and earlier, and it's really hard in that case to separate that out from the in, the, the nutrients that we have now, the increased light, you know, mm. the, the artificial light, etc., or endocrine disrupting compounds. You know, what is sorting those out is so hard. So, so puberty is advancing, you said, in human girls at about six months per decade. It's getting earlier and earlier. Mm-hmm. Interesting. What, what, about, what about in boys? Is that the same thing or something it's similar happening? It's harder to measure puberty onset in boys. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, but, uh, it, it, so the, but the, it seems more so in girls that they can do by breast development. Mm-hmm. Occurring. It's like they, they move down, like, because there's a thing called precocious puberty, right? It's when you go through puberty way too soon. And it's as low as eight years for uh, African American girls. Oh, wow. Eight years old. Yeah. It, that's considered precocious, but yeah. And for some of these endocrine disruptors, can we just be explicit for people? What are some examples of these? And can, can you just sort of list again very clearly what types of consumer products they tend to be associated with? Well, um, uh, yes, yeah, been a while. I'm, I'm not as uh, expert on this as I once was, but the bisphenol A's is one of the big concerns. And they were at one point in a lot of plastics, including baby, baby bottles and everything. And that's why now you look on the bottom, bottom of any plastic bottle, right? And it has that little, that little triangle and there's a number in the middle. And that tells you that, I, but I think, you know, that whether or not there's bisphenol A in there, I don't think any drinking um, bottles have them anymore. Uh, then there are um, antifungicides that are used on like fruit trees and things. Um, mm. Flusanol, I believe, that are antiandrogen like. And there's, you know, they're on on grapes and um, apples, and like particularly like if you're getting grapes from Central America, which most of our grapes come from Chile and things like that. Those are are a concern. Um, boy, I, there's you know the chemicals that we use, weed killers and things like that that are just i mean they're they're just they're just bad they're not just endocrine disruptors they're just nervous system toxins you know anything that you're using to kill uh uh kill plants or animals is going to be killing something in in your body as well so i see so there's just a lot there's a lot of nasty stuff in the fertilizers and yard products that we use in the food that we eat and in the physical products in some cases just plastic bottles and things like that yes Yes. And it's very, very hard. I mean, there's, there's the number of new chemicals that are manufactured is crazy, crazy and hard to keep track of. And they can just change a single molecule. And the, and the, you know, again, just like how I said, how hard it is to study THC, it's really hard to study these, these compounds because the tradition is still sort of the classic toxicology uh, looking for a, you know, lethal dose, you know, 50 kind of thing. And um, instead of looking for the more subtle, subtle, uh, reproductive effects and things. And then, and uh, you know, there's all this evidence in things like um, uh, amphibians and reptiles and seeing lots of intersex and, you know, why are all the frogs dying and et cetera. Um, you know, there's even things like birth control, steroid birth control is phenomenally stable. And so it, it can be detected in the water columns all the time because just through, through uh, the wastewater. Um, because they're, those compounds are designed to be stable so that they can pass through the human liver and not be digested. Um, oh, I see. So you're saying that some of the molecules that come from the forms of birth control we use just are so stable, they get out into the environment, and then we, we're all ingesting them at some level. Yeah. Interesting. And what, what are some of those compounds? What do they tend to be? Oh, ethylene estradiol, um, uh, uh, norprogesterone, et cetera, anything you know, that's in any of the classic you know, birth control. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is related, um, plausibly at least? I don't know if we know the answer. Is it related to you know, the decrease in sperm counts that I know that we've been seeing dramatically? 
Yeah, well, that's why I mentioned that. I don't think that the, those data are sufficiently reliable. Uh, the, the decrease in sperm count and the increase in breast cancer both suffer from the same problem of our methods of detection and quantification are so much better, right? So mm. if you get better at detecting breast cancer, you're going to detect more breast cancers, right? And if you get better at quantifying sperm counts, you, you might be much more accurate. So the last, and I, it's been a while since I've looked at the literature on that, but I, I don't think... Um, I, I, I don't think that that's held up worldwide. There are certainly certain pockets where there are big effects on sperm counts and stuff. And particularly like, you know, men who work a lot with fertilizers and things like that or heavy metals, heavy metals are always a big problem in industry and stuff. But um, this kind of global idea of, of uh, has not held up. I see. Well, we've covered a lot of ground already. Um, a lot of fascinating stuff that you told us about. Is there anything you want to leave people with or, or summarize for people that we talked about just to do with the general subject of sex differences in the brain and behavior? Yeah. I, um, uh, sometimes I get sort of pushback on that we shouldn't study sex differences in the brain because it can be abused. You know, and that's always a, a risk with any science and the idea that, you know, uh, it will it will just confirm existing biases about women's biological constraints. But um, I would say that that's not um, that's not a reason not to because of the, the the discovery potential of studying sex difference. I don't just do it, like I said, for any but my rats don't uh, they don't do mathematics. You know, they they don't. Uh, write poetry. They don't, there's nothing to do with humans, you know, cognitive abilities or anything in, in these studies. Um, but what they do reveal is fundamental mechanisms by which the brain develops and the enormous, um, uh, beautiful, extraordinary mechanisms uh, by which nature has found to develop the brain. And right now the textbooks, the neuroscience textbooks are written based on the male brain. And uh, they've missed a whole lot of, of varieties of ways that the problems have been solved in, in brain development. And, and that's to me is the, the, the that's the reason I study it is because it's like I always have I've got a contrast agent. Right. I, I can see things that you couldn't see if you just studied one sex because you wouldn't have you wouldn't have a way of knowing it was different. All right. Well, Dr. Margaret McCarthy, thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.